Bibles, I would like you to open it, please, to Acts chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. In the pew in front of you, you'll find a Bible there. Feel free to use that Bible. If you're going to use that Bible, turn to page 1301 or 1301, and that'll get you to Acts chapter 11 in your Bible so that everyone can open a Bible this morning and see from the Word of God what God has for us. So if you grab one of those black Bibles in the pew, it's page 1301, and we'll be in Acts chapter 11 this morning. So we look at Acts chapter 11. I'm going to challenge us on a name. What is your name? Now, please do not shout it to me all at once because, frankly, that's not the point of the sermon. And it would just create chaos. Names in this current culture and time may have at times some significance, but are, all, but are often uh, just some nice thing that a parents put under their children. Perhaps with some thought of, I want a a biblical name, and and maybe you're named after one of the the apostles or disciples or one of the the, the, the major characters in the Bible. Maybe you know the meaning of your name, and maybe you don't. Uh, My name is John D. Howell, and I'm the fourth. Meaning the significance of my name is I was named after my father, who was named after his father, which was named after his father. I was a fourth generation. We came down to my son, my firstborn Johnny, we call him. There was some discussion whether we're going to name him John D. Howell V or not. I wasn't sure. I thought, boy, what kind of life does that bring to a young man? And my wife's like, listen, it's been this this long, the four, you can't stop it at number five. Don't be that guy. And uh, boy, I ended that discussion. My wife said it, I did it, and that way we were done. I happen to know the meaning of my name, and, and I have reminded my wife sometimes I am aptly named. Aptly named. My, my name means God's gracious gift. That's what John means. And I'm sure you would, thank you, Brother Rob, I'm sure you'd agree that aptly named God's gracious gift, my parents were wise beyond the years when they named this young bundle of, of terror. What is your name? What does it mean? But more importantly this morning as we look at Scripture, what does God want us to be called? Because that's who matters, is it not? You may like your earthly name, you may dislike it, you may change it, and I go by JD. That's because in the house growing up with a dad named John, a son named John, it was really easy to keep them separate, JD and John, unless I was in trouble. Then my parents called me something else, which I will not mention in church, because I know enough that you bring it back up to me. But what does God know you by? A name can be descriptive. We have that in the Bible, we have that in, in current culture. A name can be mocking. My brother was a pilot in the Navy, and his first call sign uh, was given to him after he didn't land the big plane. He was flying correctly. And he, that first time taking that plane down that runway, apparently, his first set of orders and this huge jet from the Navy bounced to landing. It went a little, and, and, they, and they named a call sign after him. They followed him for a while in the Navy. A name can be mocking, can it not? Nicknames in sports or around school, it can be mocking. A name can be flattering, or a name it can merely be a name. But in this passage, in Acts chapter 11, we're going to look at two specific names that are given to us. If you look in Acts chapter 11, beginning in the first verse, the Bible says, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the Word of God. As we begin to open up this particular chapter in Scripture, we must realize that at this point, the church of God is moving full steam ahead. We've moved on in Acts chapter 1 where the disciples were commanded and commissioned by Jesus Christ to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit They got distracted. Remember, they're gazing to the heavens, and and then they obeyed. They went back to Jerusalem to wait, and and then we come to Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit moves on them mightily, and and from there, the power of God is unleashed on that small city of Jerusalem, and God's work is a mighty work, and many come to salvation. Thousands trust Christ. From there, as we move through the chapters in 3, 4, and 5, and 6, we see God continually moving people, and they each come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, believing on Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and resurrection and trusting him for salvation. And they are saved and gloriously saved. Then they're baptized as believers. They're not baptized for salvation. They're baptized after salvation to identify with their salvation. They get baptized and the Lord is growing his church. 
Last week we saw that God is now opening the doors, not just from the Jewish nation, but now to the entire earth, to all the Gentiles of if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So that's most of us in this room, if not all of us. And now God is demonstrating his power and the church is just moving. It's active. It's exciting. Aren't you glad that God can work in an exciting way? And we don't have to come to a dead church. Like, listen, no one talk as you come into church. Don't want to disrupt God. But God works, doesn't he? And he works in the multitudes, but he also wants to work individually. In this chapter, we'll see both. But this morning, I'm going to challenge you, though God wants to work like this this morning, he wants to work like this this morning as well. And so I pray you let God work in your heart as we look at what God has for us. Let's ask for a blessing on this time. Then we'll go down to our portion of Scripture. Lord, as we come to you this morning, I'd ask that you would help us. Lord, help us to see ourselves like you see us. Lord, for some, it may be discouraging or slightly discouraging. Lord, for some, it may take a moment of reflection and introspection. But Lord, after we see ourselves as you see us, may we not stay the same. Lord, the hearts that need to be encouraged, I pray they'd be encouraged this morning. The heart that needs to turn towards you, Lord, I pray that it would turn towards you this morning. Lord, may our hearts be moved, our minds be changed, and what I am asking that everything that is done here in this service this morning would please you, that our response would please you as I preach, it would please you. Lord, we'll ask you for your help, and we'll give you the praise. Lord, it's not us, it's you. Lord, help us to do our part in obedience. Be willing to change as you touch us. Lord, in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. What happened in chapter 11 is that now people are seeing that Gentiles can be saved or the whole world can be saved. And this is a phenomenon. This is it's amazing. And they're excited. In fact, the Apostle Peter, you find in the following verses, he recounts what happened in chapter 10, how God brought him a vision. And don't read it now, but later on you go back and read Acts chapter 10 where God showed him a vision with animals in a big old sheet and a big old net. And, and he's telling them what happened. And, and Peter's accounting. They're like, man, this is amazing. And God's working and people are getting saved and they're growing. And boy, this church is, is just exploding. But the church is young. Jesus Christ in John chapter 3 tells Nicodemus that when someone gets saved, when they trust Jesus Christ, it is like a new birth or like a new child. And like in the real world, in the physical world, a child must grow, spiritual children must grow. We're not here just to be saved and then that's it. We're here to be saved and to follow the Lord in obedience and to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's partly why you're here this morning, to learn about Jesus Christ. And this was happening in the church. That now these, these believers, these young believers, these men and these women and these children, the old, the young, rich and poor, they're getting saved. They're trusting Jesus Christ. They're turning from their idols. They're turning from their sin. They're turning from the old path. And they say, listen, I trust Jesus, and that's the only way to heaven. Amen? Amen. Listen, if you've never turned to Jesus Christ, and I challenge you today, All right, to turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But it doesn't stop there, it starts there. That's the beginning of a brand new journey. Therefore, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a brand new creation. Old things are passed away. Old habits, old thoughts, old struggles, and all things now become new. With Jesus Christ, you can be released and find victory over the dirty, rotten sin in your life. It could be a struggle with a substance. It could be an attitude. It could be lust. It could be speech. But Jesus Christ brings victory. All things are passed away. All things become new. This is good news. This is exciting. And these believers, they're seeing it. They're seeing it all around them. They're seeing families touched by the gospel. They're seeing men and women, boys and girls, moms and dads, single of all walks of life. And now they need some help. They need some growth. They're young Christians. They're young in the faith. They're young in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And God in his providence, 
raises up a unique individual. Please, if you look for a portion of Scripture today, we'll find it in Acts 11, beginning in verse number 22. The Bible says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, and that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I want you to notice this morning, first of all, that God uses a man called Barnabas. God uses Barnabas in this passage in such a, a profound way. The news of what was happening here in Antioch came uh, and it was brought to the, these elders and these Christians uh, and these believers uh, in Jerusalem. And they said, we've got to help these, these, young, these young believers. We've got to help these young people who've just put their faith in Jesus Christ. We've got to help them. So we will send this man named Barnabas, called Barnabas. And Barnabas left the comfort of Jerusalem, perhaps the, the friendships he had made there in Jerusalem, perhaps the established place that he had there, we don't even know if perhaps he had family there as well. All we know is that Barnabas picked himself up and went to Antioch. And this is what he did. We see, first of all, the ministry of Barnabas. The ministry of Barnabas, the Bible says in verse 22, or verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad, and here it is, and exhorted them all. That with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. When Barnabas showed up in Antioch, Barnabas began to, and the Bible word is, exhort. Exhort. What that means, it means to encourage, to challenge, to come alongside. The word is very closely linked to the same word we have for the Holy Spirit, who is called the comforter. That word comforter and what Barnabas did exhorting, they're close. One is a noun, one is a verb. On that, they're almost the same word. What Barnabas did was begin to come alongside these unbelievers, and he didn't just hit them over the head. He didn't kick them in the backside. He said, listen, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how to follow Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how to walk with Jesus Christ. And my friends, what we need, what you and I are called to, is not only to share the gospel, but to come alongside other people. And to tell them about Jesus Christ, we need Christians who will come alongside of others. We need Christians who will come and say, listen, let me, let me talk to you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what it looks like to walk with Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a little story. There was a teenager in a park. In this park, there were some young people, some toddlers on the swings. In the story, the, the toddlers were calling to the teenager, give us a push, give us a push. So the teenager went over to the toddlers and gave them a big push. Give us another push. Give him another push. Give us another push. He gave him another push. But after a while, the teenager showed the toddlers not just how to be pushed, but how to move their arms. When that happened, the teenager could slip out of the park and the toddlers could keep on swinging. If that teenager had not taught those toddlers how to swing, they would have been forever static in the swing set. What Barnabas did was come alongside the Christians. He began to teach them about Jesus Christ. He began to teach them uh, what was the, the right way. In fact, we see next of all the message of Barnabas. This is what he said. He said he exhorted them that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. This was simply the simple message of Barnabas. Let me teach you how to abide with Jesus Christ. Let me teach you how to hold on to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how to stay where Jesus is at. 
It was not about just what you wear. It was not about just what you do. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. How to study his word and to know who he is. That's cleaving unto the Lord. How to do what he says. That's abiding with him. How to pray and talk to Jesus Christ. And the message is simple. Just stay with Jesus. What a great message that we all need. Listen, when you're at work tomorrow, stay with Jesus. When your coworker is irritating you and you want to knock him out twice, what should you do? Help me. Stay with Jesus. Help me. Stay with Jesus. Today, when they're lunchtime and your son or daughter, a teenager, says something profound, what should you do? Stay with Jesus. Yes. This week when you're driving down the road and that old person cuts you off. (laughs) Stay with Jesus. Listen, this is what Barnabas did. He simply said, listen, Cleveland Lord, stay with Jesus. My friends, this is a powerful truth. We're looking for everything that's so profound and confusing. You know, Lord, give me, give, give me my next 35 steps in life, and Lord, guide every single step of the way. Just stay with Jesus. Stay with him today. When you leave church this morning, stay with Jesus. As you go to lunch, stay with Jesus. When you see the, the waitress and, and you, you give her a nice tip, give her a gospel track, and stay with Jesus. When you pump gas in your car, stay with Jesus. When you go home, you go to bed, stay with Jesus. You wake up tomorrow morning, you stay with Jesus. You simply stay with Jesus. You cleave unto the Lord. Oh, that'd be a good thing for us Christians to remember, right? How often do we get on our own path and we don't stay with Jesus, we stay with our emotions. We stay with our worry. We stay with our logic. We stay with our plans. We stay with our kids. We stay with our family. But we don't stay with Jesus. Barnabas came alongside, just like the Holy Spirit does. And in essence, he put his arm around these young believers and said, Joe, stay with Jesus. Sue, stay with Jesus. Johnny, stay with Jesus. Just stay with Jesus. I see the ministry of Barnabas. I see the message of Barnabas. But then I see a meekness with Barnabas. Barnabas gave him this message and through his ministry, but then... He did something very interesting. Apparently, along the way, he perceived, he perceived that they needed something else. The Bible says in verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 20, I'm sorry, verse, yes, verse 25, then departed Barnabas to, Sar- to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now, we've already been introduced in their chapters to Saul, who will become Paul. And Paul has been called by Jesus Christ and Paul, God will use very greatly to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And Barnabas leaves these young Christians, the ones that he's been coming alongside of, tell them to just stay with Jesus. And he goes and he goes to search for another man. And he searches and searches until he finds Saul, who will be called Paul, and he brings him back. You know what I love about this? Is that Barnabas was not consumed with, with himself. See, sometimes we get, well, it's got to be about me. I, I, I've helped this person. Oh, like, I've come alongside them. I've told them to, to, to stay with Jesus, and, and so I, no one else can help them. I, I've got to help them. No, that wasn't Barnabas' heartbeat. Barnabas said, listen, you know what? I've taken these people where they need to be here, and I've got to go find Saul. Saul can do the next part. And he goes, and I see a meekness, a humility of Barnabas. He was not there just to build his castle, but to build the kingdom. We're not in a castle erection. We're in building. We're trying to build the kingdom of God. This church is not here to build a castle. It's here to build God's kingdom. We're not here to be number one. We're here to promote he who is number one. That is Jesus Christ. That in all things he might have the preeminence. And Barnabas says, listen, you've got, Saul, you've got to come, Paul. You've got to come, and you've got to help these people. And so Paul comes back, and and he teaches there. 
for about a year. For about a year, they're there, and he's teaching them and building up these, these young Christians. I love this thought that it's not about him. It's about the bigger picture. And that's what I want the heartbeat of this church to be, and my life to be, and your life to be. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about First Baptist Church. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm glad you're here this morning, but, it, but if there's a church you ought to be a part of, be part of that church. I'm not here to beg you to be part of First Baptist Church. I'm here to beg you to follow Jesus Christ and stay with Jesus. This is what Barnabas did. This is what Saul did. When the focus shifts from striving to be the top dog to recognizing that there are talents and unique traits that someone else can bring to help someone else stay with Jesus. It's a place where competition gives a way to cooperation, where the pursuit of greatness is not pursued, but commitment to Christ is sought. This is the Barnabas way. This is where Barnabas purposefully and intentionally helped these Christians be closer to Jesus Christ. You see, this morning, there are some Christians here who need to be Barnabases, who need to come alongside someone else. Say, listen, let me help you stay with Jesus. And then to say, listen, now let me pass you off because this person will help you stay with Jesus. But what I love about this passage is God gives us another glimpse of what happens. It's a beautiful model. We could have an invitation right there, and many of us ought to respond and say, listen, I've got to put myself aside. I've got to come alongside. Others ought to respond. Pastor, pray for me. I've got to stay with Jesus, because you know what? My biggest struggle is not staying with Jesus. I'm a young Christian, and boy, I'm struggling. I need to stay with Jesus. We could have an invitation there, but I want to show you something else that happened here in this passage. Please look in verse 26. The very last phrase in verse 26. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What happened in this passage is after this year, after the, the glorious working of God and Barnabas' unique ministry, and then bringing Saul, who will be called Paul, in, then we find out that this group of believers was, were now called Christians, or the believers are living in a manner to be called Christians. Antioch, the city, was not a good city. It was called the Queen of the East. Some have likened it to a mixture between Las Vegas and New Orleans, where sin was rampant and anything could be found. Here in Antioch, they loved to use titles to mock people. Those who followed Caesar Augustus, they would call them Augustians, Herodians, and other such names. And apparently, what happened here in Antioch was not a self-labeling, but an outward mocking. So moving and so dramatic was the transformation in these young believers' lives that the pagans, the unsaved, idol-worshiping, every wickedness goes people, looked at these young believers and said, you know what? Those we're going to name and we're going to mock as Christians or little Christs. In essence, saying all they do is serve their Christ. What a title. What a title. This word Christian is only found three times in your New Testament. It's found once right here in Acts chapter 11 where the disciples were first called Christian in Antioch. You'll find it a few chapters later when Paul stands before, uh, was, was still stands before King Agrippa. And King Agrippa will say this, Almost, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a little Christ, a Christian. So this mocking name began to travel. The Christians, <laughs> the Christians. We'll find it one more time in Scripture in the book of 1 Peter, where Peter will say this, if any man suffer as a little Christian, as a Christian. This name began because there's a group of believers 
The believers called themselves believers, disciples, or followers of the way. That was their self-designation. The unsaved world said, no, 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 no. You're a little Christ. Meant as a mockery. Now claimed as a humble badge of honor. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be known as a Christian. The problem is, my friends, it's a name now that's been misused, mistreated, and maligned. Seems like the name Christian doesn't mean much anymore, does it? You get someone to work in your house, they're like, I'm a Christian, and they're welcome to the worst work you've ever had in your house. You go to a, perhaps a dealership, and a, the sales guy goes, I'm a Christian too. You find out you're getting swindled left and right. You meet someone on the street, I'm a Christian as they're living a life that's displeasing to God. Seems like the name doesn't mean much any longer. It seems like in Acts chapter 11 actually meant something then. Because they didn't claim it. The unsaved world said, all you do is focus on being a little Christ. The second challenge this morning is some of you need to be Barnabas, but some of you just need to come back to the title Christian and start to live like a little Christ. You know why they're called little Christ? Well, first of all, because that's all they talk about, Jesus Christ. That's why they're called little Christ. Why are they called a Christian? Because when the time came for them to be invited to sin, they said, no, I'm serving a new master now. Old things are passed away. I can't go with you over here in Antioch. I serve Jesus Christ. Oh, you're just a little Christian. You're a little Christ. I can't do the same things I did before because I follow someone else now. Hmm. Yeah, I'm a Christian is claimed as easily as the clothes you're wearing and often means as little. And as easily as you change your clothes today and tomorrow, people change how they live with the word Christian meaning nothing. And I wonder if it's about time and high time that we took back the name Christian and begin to live like we're little Christs. If I followed you around this week, would I know you're a Christian? If I saw what you saw, if I read what you read, if I said what you said, if I was entertained the way you were entertained this week, if I laugh at the jokes that you laugh at this week, if I interact with the people the way you interact, would I know you're a Christian? And if an unsaved person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if they followed you around, would they know? Would they label you as a Christian? Or would they say, that guy, that girl is just like everybody else. You see, what happened in Antioch is there's a group of believers, a group of followers of the way, who began to cleave and to stay with Jesus Christ. They began to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it was so moving and so genuine that their lives showed it. And the unsaved world, those who didn't know Jesus, said, you're just a little Christ. And my friends, that ought to be our testimony. Maybe some will use it in a mocking way. You're just a little Christ. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm not close to Christ at all like I should be, but I want to emulate him. I want him to be seen through my life. I want him to, to come out of my mouth. I want my decisions to reflect the fact that he saved me, that he's transformed me, that he's doing something inside here that I want to see on the outside. I want to be known as a Christian, a little Christ. A little Christ. Tony was a pastor. He attended the 10-year reunion of his high school class. He said it was fun to see his old classmates and old friends. He came across the one man who was his nemesis in high school, the bully. He was surprised that as the man approached, he still felt some of the same old angst and anxiety from high school, even though now, 10 years more than 10 years removed, he was well established and secured his life. The man approached with a wide grin on his face, an outstretched hand, and Tony braced for what he was assured was going to be the criticism and ridicule. Tony was shocked when the man said, Tony, I have to apologize for you for what I did for you in high school. I am sorry. He said, I have to tell you a story. 
He said it was just a few years ago that I was in a place where a man came and told me about Jesus Christ. And he said, Tony, I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus Christ and everything is different now. And I'm trying to live a life to please Jesus Christ. And Tony, I'm so glad I saw you. I have to apologize. God has touched me about the way I treated you in high school. Would you please forgive me? And Tony, that pastor with tears in his eyes, gave him forgiveness. Then Tony said to this nemesis, former bully, he said, Jerry, he said, that makes me so happy. He said, you see, I too am a Christian. Jerry said, Tony, that's great. When did you become a Christian? Tony said, I was young. Four or five years old, I trusted Jesus Christ. I'm a pastor now. And Jerry, according to Tony's testimony, stepped back in shock. He said, Tony, you mean to tell me that all throughout high school, you were a Christian and you never told me. Tony said those words struck deep. My friends, we're core Christians. But are we little Christs? Does our life reflect what Jesus Christ has done? See, here's the real truth to end this morning. Barnabas, that wasn't really his name. We found out in Acts chapter 4 that Barnabas, his name was was Hostess or, or Joshua. And they called him Barnabas because of the way he acted. He was a son of encouragement, son of consolation. Christian, that wasn't really their name. They were called that way because of how they acted. So this morning, my friends, the real truth is this. It doesn't matter what your name may be. God can give you a different name. You can be known as a drunk. You can be known as someone full of anger. You can be known as a jerk. But when Jesus Christ transforms a life, he can change the name. Someone who isn't known as a Christian can be known as a Christian not because they're awesome, but because Christ is amazing. The real truth is you don't have to be, you don't have to be who you were. There's a missionary, he's in Africa, gave a Bible to a a brand new convert, young believer. How the young believer just looked at that Bible and just embraced it, began to cry over the Bible. The missionary was was touched by his response, the, the man's response, the believer's response to the Bible. A few days later, the missionary, missionary met up with this young believer and, and saw the same Bible and it was tattered and torn and pages were missing. And he got a little, a little bit perplexed and a little bit passionate. He said to this young believer, what happened? I thought you loved the Bible. What'd you do with it? Why did you mistreat it? The young believer said, oh, mission, Mr. Missionary, I did not mistreat the Bible. He said, I ran back to my village. He said, I love this Bible. He said, and I went through the Bible and I tore out a page for every person in the village. I want them to have a page of the Bible. You know what that is? That's a Christian trying to be a little Christ. In Costa Rica, they have bullfighting. It's different than in Spain. Costa Rica has changed some of the the rules regarding this. One rule they've changed is that the bull doesn't die at the end in Costa Rica. And that anyone over the age of 18 who is sober can jump into the ring with the bull. Apparently what will often happen is there will be hundreds, or close to 200 people who will jump in the ring, and then the bull is released. They say, they tell me that at that moment, 90% will jump out of the ring immediately. <laughs> All those who thought they wanted to be realize they didn't want to be but a few will remain. Isn't that the way with sometimes with those who are so-called Christians? While things are easy, everyone's in the ring. God's not looking for us to jump out. God's looking for those who will stay with Jesus. So what's your name this morning? Or better question, what name does God want you to be known by? For some, you could be a Barnabas. You've got a friend, you've got a co-worker, you've got a son, a neighbor who needs you to come alongside 
and just encourage them to stay with Jesus. Maybe this morning, it's just time that you start being a little Christ in what you say and how you act. And maybe your life hasn't reflected up to this point. Maybe your coworkers know you're Christian only because you say it, but not because you live it. Well, this morning, let's let God give us a name.